right, Sonia. So we're here, episode 32 of the uh, Treatment Room Secrets podcast. The last time you were sitting here, not here, but the last time you were sitting with me in a studio was 30 episodes ago, exactly. Uh, so it's so fun to say that and so fun to have you back. How are you doing? Wow. Yeah, it is indeed fun. I'm doing well. Thank you. And it's so exciting to see the growth that you have done. 30 episodes later. <laughs> yes. <let's laughs> with this podcast. Slowly, <laughs> <Big> slowly. <applause. laughs> Thank you. Slowly, slowly. Um, personally trying to learn as much as possible. Again, about the, the podcast game. Uh, but more importantly, the the nuances of every episode um, in terms of what we're talking about, how we're talking about it. Um, and it was almost like a, a very good smack in the face, I think, uh, to have you on an episode two um, <laughs> to talk about something that I I want to say almost a year ago when we recorded that first episode that I knew almost nothing about. Um now I think I still know nothing about it, but a lot more than <laughs> no, I a lot you more know some stuff. <laughs> a lot a lot more than I did uh, last time. For example, yeah. you know, last time I I st- I I again maybe just because of what I hear and what I'm told and just you know very basic level conversation, um, I had this association of pelvic floor women. Right. But it's not the case, right? No. And we spoke about it briefly last time as well. Um, you even gave me a little, um, a little laugh and said that it's sad when people think that. <laughs> um, so I, I, I feel more educated, and I, the first thing I want to talk about, and we mentioned a couple bullet points before, but the first thing I want to talk about is your education, your development. Um, so you said you're studying some uh, some new things, which we can go one by one and talk about them. But my first question to you when you... My first question to you is when we um, when you choose to really expand your knowledge and dedicate time to studying, is it always tied to the pelvic floor and that your development of your knowledge of the core of the pelvic floor or... Could it be disassociated from it? Um, yeah, I think that first of all, I'm I'm a very like uh, normal human being like everybody else. I have many fields of interest, and I think that's exactly what makes life so much fun. Is just to have the uh, options of endless learning, and and there's so many areas that are interesting. And um, the more I study um, about different areas you will always find that red line that ties all of them back together again. So that's how I dive into, yeah, of course, studying about the human body, but then suddenly it brings you to, for example, frequencies, and then it brings you to how does the universe work? And suddenly you dive into a two-hour YouTube of hole, yeah. quantum physics, and, you know, like, of course, yeah. in the end, everything is connected, if everything is connected to the pelvic floor, maybe. <laughs> um, no, but but definitely the beauty of um, of nature and the beauty of the truth is that it is in everything and you can find it everywhere. And if you study different things and you study them with passion and with curiosity, you can always find how they inspire and affect each other so when you select and you start you know learning something spending more time on something educating yourself on it though um, are you expecting to find that holistic connection how that is how does this piece connect with everything else that I've learned right um, I think my brain doesn't work like that no? I think that I'm a quite playful person so when I find a new thing that I want to learn about it's mostly through play it's mostly through I I do something or I read about something or I watch a movie or I go out with friends or I go on a vacation somewhere or I, I take part in a class and I'm like wow this is really interesting and I would love to learn more about that and I usually do it without expectation now for example I mean there's things that I learn to incorporate them more into my business and a lot of those things I do for fun, but also a few of them I, I studied to use them as tools, right? Um, 
And then there's obviously things I do more for, for my private life and for my fun. But in the end, again, they're all mixed up together. So <laughs> it all yeah. ends up. Like it all ends connecting. up again. One one big thing. Because yeah. I guess the common denominator is that our body, everything is, involves our body, involves nature. Right. As you said. Um, so and I, I know the the last time we also spoke, um, the episode ended with you saying that you are diving deeper into your studies of sex therapy yeah um so okay so it does that have a natural connection though to your pelvic floor treatments and everything you do around that because also we spoke about that um that big element of that of the of um sexuality when it comes to the pelvic floor right so um let's let's start from the beginning so as a pelvic floor physiotherapist which is my actual profession right um i'm seeing and helping people to um, manage and overcome um, such things as chronic pain or sexual dysfunctions uh, or any pelvic floor dysfunctions that are related to pregnancy uh, or postpartum um, again men and women have pelvic floors and men and women um can experience dysfunctions or um, any symptoms in that area. And both should be interested in that area, not to actually um, treat it when it's already um, like damaged or in a dysfunction, yeah. but actually, yeah, just take care of it and keep it healthy and, and being, again, playful and interested about about the healthy functions. Um, so what I, what I noticed in my practice is as a physiotherapist, we are trained in treating and diagnosing physical um, dysfunctions. So with the pelvic floor, I really quickly came to a stop there, a, a kind of like a block that I ran into. And um, there are certain diagnoses that are not rooted in the physical body and treating them there will very fast um, lead to a dead end or even it would even like um, be less helpful for the person themselves because they would say, okay, let's say um, uh, erectile dysfunction. Okay, let's, let's take an example for men. Erectile dysfunction, we see the dysfunction in the body, right? The body doesn't function as the man would expect it. But the cause in many cases is not in the body. It is the mind body. It is the connection between the body and the mind, which is the connection of our emotional system um, and our physical. So, so this is the block I ran into. And, and a lot of those um, um, difficulties um, that people come to me with are... Uh, a really mind body um, issue so you can like when assessing someone speaking to them looking at them um, you can almost tell that physically everything should be fine everything should be functioning correctly so first of all people go to the doctor um, if they ha first of all <laughs> with erectile dysfunction it's a bit more difficult than that right because men usually it's there's a lot of shame about it yeah. um, there is a lot of um, issues also with, with men amongst themselves, that there's not a lot of information flowing and they're not talking so much about their mm -hmm. struggles. Um, but let's say let's say uh, somebody um, experiences uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, if they are a young, healthy, non-obese um, uh, or with a, with a diabetes in the background or any disease that could promote erectile dysfunction, um, they can still do, to do tests um, with a doctor, with their urologist. Um, and after the doctor said, okay, there's no physiological or organic um, cause for this dysfunction, then they would be referred to, for example, a sex therapist um, or any kind of therapist that they can start and just um, like look into the socio-emotional um, background of their dysfunction. And that's basically what sex therapy is. So sex therapy is um, a result of the psychophysiological studies of in the 1960s of a gynecologist named William Masters and a psychologist named Virginia Johnson. 
So these two were kind of the pioneers that set the base for uh, most of the treatments that are um, being provided today for people with non-organic sexual uh, dysfunctions or struggles. Yeah. And so if we stick to the 1960s for a second, what type of thing were they doing then? Yeah. So they, they conducted um, studies. Okay. So they took um, couples back then and um, just looked at their looked at their sexual um, behaviors and um, and studied healthy sexual behaviors. Stu- studied couples. Um, so the good thing is that there was a gynecologist and uh, a psychologist. So the gynecologist um, or the doctor could eventually see the phys- physical aspect of things yeah. and the the physical um, um, presentation. What might have been first of all a psychological. A manifestation and the psychologist could then also um, f- reflect that or mirror that back and so they had a really holistic picture of of their of their couples and of their clients and um, what is also really important to see about sexual health is that um, and that is something that is really missing for us in this healthcare model that we're treating um, clients is that we always look at just one person. Let's say one person in the relationship is being pointed a finger at like, you have mm-hmm. the erectile dysfunction, I'm fine, you having erectile dysfunction, you go to the doctor. Um, and then this person sits there by themselves and they're like, yeah, I have erectile dysfunction. Um, it's hard for me to have an erection. Either they're in a relationship or they're not. And, and they're, they're telling what, talking about the story. And then they can talk about their own emotions and, and psychology that can help for sure. But when a person um, is in a relationship or if, if it's a re- reoccurring um, pattern, it is a dynamic between two people. Um, mm. And that is what sexual health is, is our ability to, to interact in also a sexual, but more so in an intimate context with other people. So, yeah, if we're talking about that, it's more about intimacy, basically. And that brings us down a whole new rabbit hole, which I'm happy to talk <laughs> about. <laughs> um, intimacy, absolutely. But so yeah. with with um, like with sex health, like sexual health, is it... Um, oh, I'm sorry. I said it. But yeah, sexual Did health I say it in is the right context? just not the title of uh, my studies, but it's definitely uh, what we're talking about. So yeah. cool. So yeah, but, so, but you said uh, sex therapy is... So it, it does come down to intimacy... Um, it comes down to conversation um, less because again like you know you. what I, did you imagine when no, you heard yeah, that I was going to say I straight tell away, me straight uh, up without I, shame what did you, know, you no, imagine no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I can say the words here um, <laughs> no but I straight away imagine like you know physical guidance physical things physical right? guidance sit on top yeah. turn around yeah. 360 try this try that and yeah. landing Kam, <laughs> Kama, exactly. Sutra, Kama Sutra Kama book. Sutra exactly use more spit yeah that's not what we're doing in class <laughs> um, I, I can show you like the I can walk you through how a class looks like so I'm sitting there with about uh, 25 uh, other women. We're, they're all in their 40s, 50s, 60s. All women. We have a lot of religious uh, women that study with me. Mm. Very, uh, I think it's amazing and so courageous and and so inspiring. They're going to their communities and they're bringing more help into also their religious communities about um, sexual education, and sexual health. Because, you know, you, you said that it all comes down to conversation and intimacy. Yes. We know, again, stereotypically that those communities probably suffer from that the most, no? Um, they, yeah, they, they have. Yeah, but all of us, all of us. I, I, don't, I don't believe in like yeah. putting it into those groups more. I think that the vanilla and all of us <laughs> communities have a lot to learn as well. And I don't yeah. think, um, yeah, I mean, for sure. But but so. so this but is, is, there, is it only women in the class, you said? There's two men. Okay. There's yeah. two men. A family doctor. Um, is no, I, d- no, well. I, just, I didn't know if it was like an exclusive women class. No, oh, yeah. no. We want everyone to study yeah. that. It's just, yeah, I guess women are a bit easier with that. Um, and so this studies is for designed for therapists. Okay. I'm a physiotherapist. And I'm there is kind of rare. Um, I'm there with two other physiotherapists. Um, and we, after we finish the studies, we won't have a title such as a uh, sex therapist, right? Because I'm not a therapist. I don't have a base education in conversational uh, psychology, in, in, in psychological treatments. Yeah. So I'm using these studies to um, 
to support my work as a pelvic floor physiotherapist and to um, to create a better understanding and to add on to my knowledge about physiological um, issues to to get, get more depth into my treatments, right? So I have a lot of um, more insights and I have a few more colleagues now that I can refer to and mm. actually know when a person has reached a limit of physical treatment and then I can say okay great we we um, we came to a to a kind of like stagnation and then I refer them on to my colleague who yeah. will dive with them more into the physical emotional aspect and then maybe after this block is treated then they come back to me so we're it's not like in stages but it's like more bouncing back and forth yeah yeah. You have a uh, more of a direction maybe for that, more more stages of treatment. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, so so sex therapy for everyone also who who wonders if that would be something for them to consider, it is a great way to um reconnect to your emotions in a very useful way that can help you to build more intimacy with people. Intimacy is a th very I think you nice just, word. I think you just described the scariest thing for most people, it right? It says, yeah, well, you know what it actually means? Intimacy, it means into me see. And that's scary for people to look inside of yourself. Because mm -hmm. when we are in an intimate meeting with another person, that could be just sitting across each other, looking each other into the eyes, which is a very scary thing for many people. Now that I said it, we're both like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that that is that is intimacy, <laughs> eye contact, right? Yeah, yeah. You have to feel comfortable with another person, and also, let's say another intimate situation, being naked with another person in the room, um, that is very scary. And and if you have a lot of emotions inside of you that you're not in touch with especially emotions such as shame or fear, um, shame of what you are, who you are, how you look like, uh, fear of not being enough, fear of being exposed to something, all of these fears that we all carry inside of ourselves. But when we're coming to these like really focal points of intimacy, they, these fears can overwhelm our, our system that they basically shut down the body. From your experience, is it usually is it rash is it rational fears that people face, or is it um, somewhat made up or based on feedback, external feedback that they receive from someone? You know, someone tells you you look ugly, so for the rest of your life you're afraid to get naked. Um, so is it usually something like that, external or irrational, coming from within? Just people maybe that have um, maybe the wrong sense of what they look like. Um, I'm not sure. I think, yeah, as a therapist, I would like to to, <laughs> to ask you a few questions about what you just said. But first of all, I want to clarify that emotions are always valid. Mm. Okay? Whatever you feel is okay. And whatever you feel <laughs> needs yeah. to be validated. Mm -hmm. And even if, I, if you're telling me, and I mean, you look amazing, you're a beautiful man. And even if you tell me, oh my God, I'm so ugly, please don't look at me. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm like, and I won't tell you what, you're so stupid. You're so beautiful. Like you will, you will not, like, it doesn't matter, right? Mm. So it doesn't matter if your, your fear is intelligent yeah, and yeah. has a foundation in truth, whatever that is. Because it's what I believe because right now. Because it's what you, what I feel. What Whatever you feel is your world, is your universe, and that what is tr it's true. Mm. You're creating your own world. So in your own world, that is a, a law. So what we want to do is we first of all need to believe you, and we need to say yes. Tell me your fears, and I mm. hear you. And that's why the, the phrase "I hear you" is a very powerful phrase. If somebody it, uh, tells you when when you are with someone and, you, and they tell you a fear of the of theirs, you can tell them, "I hear you. I hear you." And sometimes that's all they need to actually realize themselves mm. that it's okay and they are held and it's a safe space. So in the end, that's where we need to start is just to create the, the area, the, the space for us to... So, so I, I, think, I think I agree, um, mm -hmm. but only after maybe thinking about it more in depth. But intuitively... 
let's say someone does tell me something intimate about themselves, um, even if to me it seems irrational, saying I hear you to someone, maybe I'm validating this irrational f- fear that they have. So I'm, uh, but I, but now maybe I'm cementing it in there. So you know, if someone tells me something, I feel I feel ugly. But I can see this person, and I can see they're the most beautiful person in the world. They say ugly, I say I hear you. So maybe right. now I'm even like putting another layer of this. Right, I totally now, agree. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. that they're ugly. That was not a great example to okay, say yeah. I, I, I'm ugly. I hear you. Yeah, <laughs> that is maybe it's like a bit rude, <laughs> for sure, for sure. But we do want to, like, we want to. V- so, so in general, I don't like. Again, I'm not a therapist, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm, I won't go inside of like how to, um, to how to to therapy someone with phrases right okay, now yeah, because yeah. again that's not something I want to promote yeah. in my podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. but I definitely want to say that mm-hmm. if you um, have have um, uh, difficulties with intimacy um, because you feel there's a lot of shame a lot of fear about who you are what you bring um, the first step for yourself is to tell yourself that this is okay it is okay to be scared of of intimacy with yourself or with others. And intimacy doesn't mean sex or sexuality. Intimacy means a certain sense of vulnerability and bringing all of your emotions as they are to yourself. That means not judging yourself for carrying anger, for carrying fear, um, for being vulnerable, for being soft, all of these things. So this is intimacy. Yeah. It's not about sex or penetration at this point, yeah. right? Yeah. So so this is the thing. It's okay. It's okay to be scared. And in sex therapy, you will learn to, to bring up those suppressed emotions that you're having when you're not saying it's okay. When you, when you are um, saying, I'm too soft, like let's say about, uh, again, a man, you know, um, saying i'm too soft not I'm macho too this yeah. i'm yeah i'm not a, i'm not man enough i'm not enough um and you're pushing this aside and you're always saying like no no i shouldn't i shouldn't think like that i, I should be just optimistic i should just be positive positive and you're pushing all of these things aside and then the, uh, there's it's accumulating itself and therapy just helps you to bring that back up and to in- integrate this and sex therapy is especially great because you can do that with yourself, you can go there by yourself, but then you can also invite your partner and you can go there together. Um, and I actually think that it is amazing for couples to go to see a sex therapist even before they have issues or before mm. they have problems. Preventative. Preventative, just to get some input. You know, if you feel in the beginning there's maybe one or two things, even in communication, that you're kind of like running against it, it's good to just get couples therapy input before mm. things hit the fan do people do that preventative like uh, sex I wish, therapy i wish <laughs> i mean i yeah. go a lot to workshops you know i'm giving a lot of workshops i'm going to a lot of workshops just for fun yeah. just because learning is so much fun and learning about sex there's nothing more fun than that i mean <laughs> nothing more on. engaging <laughs> let's, let's let's be honest nothing more engaging than that yeah. engaging yeah, yeah. yeah i mean for me it's just pure fun yeah. it's just playing it's just a, a part of <laughs> of us and they're yeah. like it's it's something that we can definitely start to remove the shame from and just integrate it into our lives, right? Yeah. Yeah. So is that our biggest challenge, to remove the shame, the embarrassment that um, is always lurking around when any conversation around sex? Uh, It's one of them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it's weird now... um, no, I'm going to regret saying this, but I have a uh, I have a little sister, yeah, um, and she's always seen as like the the baby in the house, the princess, you know. She's the youngest of four kids, uh, three older brothers, and now she's in her early twenties and she has a boyfriend. And it's just a weird one to talk about. Not weird in a bad way, but there is that cultural um, little hump that we all have to get over as a family, just to be able to talk about our little sister's relationship without feeling any awkwardness or weirdness because we all agree there shouldn't be but culturally there still is because this is what we grew up on this is what we used to this is what you know for 
decades we've been saying uh, she's never going to see anyone and we're going to protect her, you know? Um, and then it just happens because it's life and then we just have to deal with it. And then you realize that it's just normal. It's just us, right? Um, so is that the biggest thing, the hurdle of uh, the awkwardness that, surround, uh, that goes around uh, this, you know, sex, sex therapy, um, intimacy, vulnerability, being naked? Yeah, yeah. So it's, be, think... it's being naked, it's being naked uh, when you say that, is that, you know you you said before like being naked is um like people are scared of it is it you mean like physically naked like being naked or also just figuratively um just being so exposed that, like you or if you're you know in a relationship you are naked with your emotions you're naked with your vulnerability like you're open this is yeah. me intimacy is that intimacy for everyone is something else like if a person is very comfortable being naked um, um, and they're naked all the time but then suddenly they're with somebody and, and doing eye gazing or the, the intimacy can mean different things for different people and and that's always very important to keep in mind um, and that's where we come to the topic of boundaries as well and that's also a big big thing in sex therapy um, to learn about your boundaries and your needs and where um and what boundaries do you want to keep up? And again, boundaries is not walls. It's not an. It's not exchangeable with the, with wa walls, but mm -hmm. it's actually um, kind of like a, a membrane. So, so it's a bit more fluid. So we have boundaries to invite in the love. We don't have boundaries that are like like harsh and like you know restrictive. Yeah, I mean, again, you can you can express your boundary in whatever way is is um, does is requested by the situation, right? But if we talk about intimacy and how can we feel safe and express intimacy, we need to learn our boundaries. And boundary work is the the non plus ultra for anyone who wants to be in any kind of relationship. If it's a friendship, if it's with your family, if it's in a sexual relationship, um, you need to know your boundary game. If you are... Um, if if you are not sure what your needs are and what your emotions mean as they rise up and you don't know how your anger feels like. Anger is, for example, an emotion that shows us what we like and what we don't like. Yeah. And um, if we suppress the anger, it, it's expressing itself in either people pleasing and we're not saying anything or in exploding. And then you see those people who are like smiling, smiling, smiling outside, everything dandy. And then in a relationship, they're the ones that are like exploding at home and just shouting. And, and they're like, no, no, I, I'm not an angry person. But if you push me, I'm just explode. So this is an unhealthy expression of anger. And anger is a great emotion, really great emotion. It's just really stigmatized. Anger is also the emotion of our creativity. And anger is a really important emotion to have for sex, especially also for orgasms our anger is suppressed um, there is so, there can be some issues in our in our sexual e expression as well so all of our emotions have a function also in our sexual functions because our emotional system equals our sexual um, system and there's a lot of cycles that run parallel in those two and does areas. the sexual system depend on the emotional system yes to, yeah yeah that's why, like, so something like erectile dysfunction, is it usually because of, again, if someone's not obese and, you know, don't have all these... If there is uh, no organic explanation, then it's yes. like Yeah, it's like a, an emotional an emotional thing. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned also, you touched on needs, sexual needs. D mm -hmm. Does that come into... Um, not sexual needs. I touched on uh, your needs. Mm, what does okay. Danny need? What are your needs? What are your what are your what does your heart need? In a in any given intimate relationship? In any moment. Are you thirsty right now? This is more like a not an emotion, but you know, it's a need to also, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you tired? Do you need a rest right now? Do you wanna maybe you need a deep breath yeah. to to come back into the moment. These are all needs that we need to mm -hmm. fulfill every given moment, right? Do I need a hug right now? Do I need to you know, tell myself I'm fine. Yeah. These are all needs. So the boundary, the boundary thing. It's, mm -hmm. You said it's like an important also step in you internally first and then into your relationships. With the boundaries, 
is it a even if the boundaries are not again you said they're not walls so they're not there to block a certain path forever but setting a boundary is that the the best way or the easiest way to flow into a level of intimacy because if you, if i set a boundary into our relationships then i know where they the boundary stands right now and i can express myself within those boundaries mm -hmm. knowing that you know these boundaries you're not going to push me over these boundaries and then once we may be comfortable with being naked within these boundaries then that can expand and expand and expand and it can also go back and back and back that's If, the great thing about mm, boundaries they're not going just one direction they can go any direction they can go left right up down mm, they can i can tell you today yes i can tell you tomorrow no i can tell you in what two minutes yes and then i can tell you in five minutes no and how can i do that i practice my communicational skills so the moment that you know and you feel me and you know why I said no yet now, but then I say yes in five minutes. And when you can understand that and I can like um, express myself in a way that you can, that's great. If you can't, also that's also fine. <laughs> yeah. Again, we're not here to, to please everyone, yeah. right? And that's especially important when we talk again about um, sex and sexual health. What I see a lot in women, for example, is um, the pain with penetration. Um, pain with penetration, again, can have organical um, uh, backgrounds. That's why you go to a pelvic floor physiotherapist. That's a big part of my job is to see in the pelvic floor um, if there is any um, uh, anything with the tissues, if there's anything with the skin, um, or is it anything that she, that that, um, that the woman does um, more functionally? Now, the functional aspect of the pelvic floor is the contraction and relaxation yeah. of the pelvic floor muscles, right? Um, and when the pelvic floor muscles are being contracted and clenched, um, then this can be painful, right? Um, and so there's a few emotional reasons uh, why somebody would clench their pelvic floor muscles even though they're actually right now engaging with someone to an act of penetration mm. right so a lot of these um, th there's a there's a lot of reasons what I want to connect to right now is when we talked about boundaries and also expectations and I think that's a huge one also in sexual health is expectation so we have this like dating culture or even in a relationship because um, because even it's valid for friendships no like intimate friendships right what I want to go right now is is, is sex okay. so we have expectations. So not friendships Fr friendships plus exactly <laughs> so so there is this role play there's this like kind of um given uh play right there is like okay now there was a dinner and then you're gonna have a drink and then hey do you want to come upstairs yeah sure and you're upstairs and then yeah. if you just catch each other's eyes for a second too long what usually happens is that the 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 person gets this expectation and even both of them maybe both of them don't want to have sex in that night maybe both of them feel like a bit vulnerable maybe it feels a bit fast but the script boom is falling on both of them like they're, they're catching eye contact and like ooh, we looked into each other's eyes a few seconds too long right now it feels kind of like uncomfortable and also a kiss can sometimes break this discomfort of the intimacy of the eye contact it's like ooh, like there's so much happening that you're just like okay let's just like close your eyes and just like go for the kiss you know just like to, to break it for a second and then because you're already kissing you're making out probably with both of your eyes closed so both are like blind now and just like going for it and like kissing so much easier <laughs> so much easier there's no intimacy right it's just like flesh on flesh right and whoa just like the lips and the tongues happening and then from there it's like okay like now the script asks actually for intercourse right so now you're like mumbling rumbling going kissing um and 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 both of both of the people are again it's it's if there's no communication it will lead to foreplay maybe and then to penetration and then yeah so in a heterosexual scene this would be basically how it would look like um, so these are the expectations and with communication, with boundary setting, yeah. we can say, hey, you know what? It's okay to after a day, just look into each other's eyes and it's not awkward because if I can't look into your eyes for a minute, 
ask yourself the question, do I want to have sex with you? Do I want to have my most intimate parts mingled up with yours if I can't even enjoy your eye gazing for like a few seconds, if I feel uncomfortable with you looking into my eyes? If you're having sex with another person, you're not looking into their eyes? It's happening all the time. People don't look into each other's eyes and people don't breathe. These are the two biggest causes for painful penetration. Oh, breathing. So breathing is important breathing for the relaxation of the uh, yeah, of that region. Yeah. Let's talk about the connection of breath and 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 penetration for a second for both genders. So the pelvic floor sits in the bottom of the pelvis, right? If you don't know where the pelvic floor sits, buy the online course <laughs> that we just produced. I talked about it like five hours where the pelvic floor sits. <laughs> so And only only good feedback so far. Yeah. <laughs> so it sits in the bottom of the pelvis, okay? It's like yeah. a dome-shaped yeah. um, uh, three layers of muscles. Yeah. Now, um, on it's top... almost like, um, so creating like a, uh, like a sheet, almost, that yes. sits between the... Uh, the, uh, like the, the sit bones. The sit bones, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. And then we have on the on the other end. More I told you my education on it improved since last yes, time. Yes, you did. <laughs> I've been thinking, trying to think of analogies. Uh, but yeah, please. great a sheet. I love yeah. that. Though. I love that. So um, it sits between the sitting bones. Yeah. And then on the top we have our rib cage, and the rib cage carries our breathing muscle, the diaphragm, and the diaphragm as well is a dome-shaped muscle. So now imagine when you're grabbing your ribs here, like all around. So this is where this mm -hmm. is where your your diaphragm divides your chest cavity from your abdominal cavity. Okay, so like a sheet. And then in the bottom we have the pelvic floor. So they're parallel to each other. Now every time I'm taking an inhale, my diaphragm is expanding downwards because it needs to accommodate more air in the lungs. Mm. So it's contracting and sucking the lungs down so the air can come inside. When something moves inside of the body, right, you're filling your body with something, with air, we need to make more space for that air. So the abdominal organs will now descend downwards to accommodate the fresh air you took in. And as they descend downward, also the pelvic floor will join into this pattern and will descend downward. So our body is this pumping machine, right? So the breath is the pulse of our organs that is moving our organs up, down, to the sides, right? Because we're not a 2D model, we are a 3D model. So breath is 3D. It's like this, this pumping, moving organism, like a big cell, right? That has yeah. its own pulse. Now, during um, an intimate um, meeting of two people, it could be a conversation. You can also see that um, the nervous system is matching up. Right. If yeah. I would be like very nervous and like sitting here, maybe maybe we would see that also in your gestures or, or, or body language. Yeah. And the same thing is happening with the breath. The breath is an expression of our nervous system state. If I breathe slow, it says something about where I'm at right now. If I breathe faster, it tells you how my status of excitement might be right now. And as we are um, breathing with each other, it's syncing us up, right? So it's not just tantric approaches of like, let's do some crazy orgasmic breathing. It's simple um, neuroscience about what's up with your nervous system. So back to the pelvic floor muscles. When the pelvic floor is in a protective tension, subconsciously, right? The woman wants to have sex right now. I mean, she's here, it's fun. But somehow it hurts. Why does it hurt? It's because subconsciously she's not aware that her nervous system is not synced up yet. She's not. She hasn't arrived in this moment. Either it's too fast. Maybe one of her needs isn't met. Maybe, maybe the need before a sexual physical act, there needs to be some different type of intimacy prior to that, so her nervous system can come to what we call the parasympathetic tone, okay? And, and so that's where the breath, and that's where we, you see how we're cycling through the systems already, yeah. how we're connecting all kinds of different dots. So being really centered in sexual health, you will connect to emotional health. You will connect to nervous system um, interactions with others and how are we syncing to each other in that moment, right? 
So you're saying like, uh, you know, even two people together. Yeah. And there's, um, so you're saying the nervous systems of two people almost sync up if they're at the same um, space? E everything you see, look around. Like, like the light influences you right now. The setting, my voice, your own voice, mm, like my ha gestures. So how, how I, how my nervous system accepts what is going on here what we're doing right now right and then we want to create the same environment or the same reaction from your nervous system so that we can come here sit down and do this thing at the yeah. same level together both wanting to do it and it working so that's our nervous system matching the we are experiencing the world through our senses right yeah no but so you're saying like, but like the, the example that you gave with uh with sex is like uh right. the, so the woman wants to do it she's there she said yes but her nervous system is not there. Right. So like, you know, you could be here today. You said, mm -hmm. yes, you'll show up, but right. obviously you're not here. Like right. you're here physically, but you're not here. And that's where we use the term, somebody's being connected to themselves. So we have our conscious and we have our subconscious. And the more I, I spend time with asking myself how I feel and actually feeling how I feel and feeling my emotions, the better I become in understanding the language of my body, because the, the body speaks all the time. To you. The body speaks internally, externally. Body language is a term for you that we see externally. But right now you feel your body temperature. You feel your, your butt pressing on the chair. But also you feel internal sensations. The more you tune in, you feel your digestion. You feel you know, internal things as your heartbeat, your breath, we can, we can feel the body and we can feel emotions. They're actually physical sensations. Mm -hmm. Fear is a uh, pressure on the chest for a lot of people, or it could be heaviness in the neck area. Um, emotions are, are feelings in the body. Mm -hmm. So this woman coming back to her, um, sometimes we live more in the head than we do in the body. And when the head is taking a decision to have sex with someone, the body does not have to consent to that. So sometimes our mind and our, our thoughts are consenting, but our body does not. And that's, a, that's so many women I see in my day to day. And I'm sure for people who also treat men, that's also what they see in the same way. I don't want to put that in a genderified yeah. corner. Um, humans live today in their head. We are rationalizing our emotions. We are rationalizing what we feel in our body. Um, being tired is being weak. Resting is a sign of weakness. Um, pushing through is a sign of strength. And having many sexual partners and, and, and having sex a lot is, is uh, promoted, you know, as well in, in certain areas. So, yeah. so but why does, does that have like having multi multiple sexual partners? Is that something that can affect you negatively? If you want that, that's great. But that's what I'm saying. Are we? Are, made for are, it? Is every no? Is everyone can do whatever they want? But do you want it? Does all of your being want that? Is your body on board? Is your emotions on board? Is that what you need, mm. or are you using sexuality to fulfill a different need that you have? Are you actually craving intimacy? Are you craving a hug? Do you have anyone to hug? Do you do you, do you receive a lot of non-sexual intimacy is that what you're craving actually just closeness with another human being and you're using sex to to get that and after after you feel empty i think that's a good way to figure out if a person really wants to have that many sexual partners does it fulfill you does it make you happy and if the answer is no then please go inside your emotions and ask yourself what do you really want do i want connection do i want a good conversation but don't pay for the good conversation with sex. You don't have to pay for it. You can have it for free if that's what you want. And I think that's where a lot of pain is coming from. Re recurrent yeast infections. Um, pain with penetration. I said that already. Um, a lot of pain um, in the vulvodynia. All of these things are, are also in a way a lack of recognizing their own needs and setting boundaries that are... Again, boundaries a lot of the time is not something that other people are like um, tempting. Like, it's mostly self-sabotage, 
Like mm. because it's not someone we, imposing the boundaries on you, it's you imposing them on yourself. Or not keeping them. Or yeah, not, um, it's not somebody breaking your boundaries. I think that because if I say no to a man, I think like, I don't know, in my experience, when I said no, thank God, most of the time it was totally respected. But the most dangerous person for my boundaries is myself, especially for sexual boundaries. Like, I mean, we all have been there. We said no, and they were like, ah, you know what? Never mind. And then afterwards, we're like, oh, I feel horrible. So, yeah, that's uh, a thing that. So I heard you, um, you said on the last episode that your, a huge component of your job is helping your clients, patients see, try and make their unconscious as conscious as possible. So you encourage them to look within. You encourage them to at least um, um, expose for themselves or recognize, not expose, but recognize their own emotions and to try and, is that the step number one, to try and recognize and accept them before even trying to interpret why do you feel that way? Why are you doing this? Why do you keep breaking your own boundaries? Why do you let people break your boundaries? Right. Um, so in my niche, I wouldn't go to the why because that would overstep kind of like my my area of expertise i'd say so i um next to the sex therapy i mm -hmm. took um, another course which is called prt pain reprocessing therapy and this course is targeted especially on chronic pain um, and the chronic pain management it's basically um a a, a approach rooted in the neuroscience um, which is an evidence-based tool that uses psychology and mindfulness to rewire chronic pain pathways in the brain. Which Physical is, pain? Or both? Uh, what other pain? What do, what do you mean? Emotional? Emotional pain. Um, Psychological pain? Yeah, it's actually great that you said that because, yeah, so this is a great question because... You can use it for so many things and you can use it exactly for all these areas you just said. You can use it for any perceived threat. So um, so pain, do you know what a great uh, definition I learned from this course about pain is? Pain is sensation plus fear. Mm -hmm. So you get a sensation, but suddenly there's a wave of blah, blah, fear. And then this sensation becomes a big threat. And this threat translates into a very uncomfortable stimulus. Mm, okay. Okay. But so can pain be just sens just sensation? No, for some because people? otherwise it's just a sensation. Mm. So, but, otherwise okay. you wouldn't tell me about it. If you have right now yeah. a sensation on your left shoulder, like some tingling there, would you like tell me about it? You would probably not feel that it's bother or like necessarily to point out that you're having a sensation i see but so the fear part is what makes it stick out in our brain as something to that we need to pay attention to exactly because usually the 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 way that we are educated about about pain and that's exactly what this um treatment approach um is attaching to is how do we know what's good and bad in this world it's not all given to us by our DNA and kind of like bred into us, but we learn it, right? I I know what good what's good and bad. I know which food is healthy. They can see my 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 yeah. finger movements, but like healthy, yeah. unhealthy food, quote unquote, yeah, quote unquote. Um, so how do we know which sensation in what area, or, or, or you know, what is what what kind yeah. of pain, and what do we have to do? So we know about one kind of pain in the general population. Biological pain, pain that lives in the body, that is compared to I'm putting my hand on the stove and I'm burning it and then I have to pull it away from the stove so I won't cause um, structure damage in my tissue, right? So this is the pain that we know. That means now every time that I feel when I'm working out, I feel like a stinging in my shoulder or when I lift something, I feel something in my back, I'm, I'm scared. And this fear can be expressed very minor. I'm like, oh, mm, yeah. But then for other people, when they have some stories attached to their body already, and maybe some doctors or some people with authority pointed some things about their body out already, then they have a bit higher flags on this area. So receiving yeah. a sensation from that area will immediately um, put them in a place of alert. 
and they will um, perceive the world around them through different filters. And these filters, we all of them, ha we all have them, right? Yeah. Because as we said in the beginning, when you said, um, are fears rational or, or like where they're rooted? And I told you that um, in your universe, in your little world that lives inside of your head, <laughs> that makes sense. in your brain, that is, that is your world. So your filters are different than my filters. We're looking around and your perspective is different from my perspective. And every single person on this planet has their own universe in their heads and because we are, when we are friends with other people it means that we maybe have similar filters or we have good communication skills so we can communicate our filters i can explain you very well how my side of the room looks like for me yeah and um, so that's why we can connect to people but in the end we all have different filters so if i get uh, if i'm completely healthy right i made a i made a a, a scan of my lower back and I know that I don't have any um, anything structurally wrong even if I have a little um, a little injury on my disc or something we know that that's not causing chronic pain for the whole life okay yep. um, so but if I'm getting a sensation there the question is what is my filter do I perceive that as a threat to me do I think that this is going to cause me lifelong pain because I'm fragile and my lower back is damaged? Or do I have the trust in my body and I am able to um, regulate my lenses and see this sensation for what it really is? And this pain is called the neuroplastic pain. When this goes wrong, when a person has proven no physical um, reason to have this pain still, even if they had an injury at one point, but the pain that we talked about before, this acute biological pain, this has uh, a timeline, okay? This pain will end. And when the healing is completed, this pain will be gone. We'll be talking about all the pains, all the fears that are chronic, five, 10 years, even everything is chronic is more than three months, basically, right? So a pain, yeah. six months, one year. So, so that's where this. Um, so, is th three months the threshold? Chronic pain is okay. defined as pain longer than three months. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, how does that connect um, to the sex therapy? So, so let's give a little, maybe like a little. Um, if just for just to end that that point that you made mm -hmm. um, with the with 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 the neuroplastic pain. So you're saying so if I now know, um, right. So now, like, I maybe I got my shoulder scanned, you know, I had it checked. I did all the measures to that I can do to um, just get a good analysis assessment of my shoulder, and all the pieces indicate that whew, I'm I'm good. My body's good. My shoulder joint, um, my shoulder complex is good. I'm safe. There's no reason for me to fear anymore. Yeah, but most anymore. of the people won't react like this. But, but theoretically, yeah. <laughs> if I react that way, mm -hmm. then. I'm my, I'm more capable of absorbing it and allowing the pain to subside and disappear. Yes. That's the end point for the pain. Yes. So we know that people who whose brain structure mm -hmm. generally is uh, more optimistic and is more rooted on um, trust and looking on the bright side, kind of. Um, Those annoying people. Yeah. <laughs> these people will have a better chance of not um, developing chronic pain. Now, if a person um, deals already with a tendency of their brain, this, we're talking about filters here, right? The way that you perceive your world is through filters of your memories, experiences, and belief systems, which you have accumulated in throughout your life. Every person has a different filter. Now, there is people who through trauma, for example, um, trauma is a big thing, um, traumatic events, let's call it like this. We all have had traumatic events in our lives, but the way that they are um, held and the way that they are integrating into who we are plays a big role in the way that we are dealing with threats in our life. Yeah. Now, if my brain structure and my body um, went through uh, uh, traumas and my nervous system and my body 
and my brain are still in a state of, of hypervigilance every time that there's a threat being uh, opposed to, to the system, um, that's when my brain will interpret um, and mix up signals in a more um, in an overproportioned way. And that's how chronic pain can be created. Mm. That means the lens of fear applies to everything. So chronic pain does not necessarily mean that structurally... There's structure damage, this, yes. At all? There's or, no at all or ever or always. Yeah, it's yeah. But, always... But the proportion is definitely off. <laughs> it's always, never, and always. Exact stuff. Yeah. So so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tool and it's a certain mm. type of population that has neuroplastic pain. Mm. There is assessments that I do with my clients um, to find out if they have biological or um, a neuroplastic or a mixed function, a mixed yeah. form. Again, it's not black and white, never. Yeah. So I have yeah. a lot of clients that I just sprinkle that in as a tool for them. Now, this tool works through mindfulness and certain psychological techniques that we're sprinkling in to a mindfulness meditation that they that they can do daily or whenever they need it. So this tool is extremely powerful. I have crazy success with it with my clients. One of my clients had um, she went to physiotherapy treatments for chronic hip pain um, that she has since 10 years, 10 plus years. Um, she has children, she has grandchildren. Um, she's in her 60s. Um, she went to physiotherapy for about five years and now she wanted to go have a surgery. She saw me like three times before she had the surgery and we reduced her pain by about 60 to 70 percent, which was the, the most that she has ever experienced being less um, with the pain. And she even thought about canceling the the surgery after we had these few sessions. And I have a few more stories like that. So, so a lot of people like you know could um, could experience chronic pain, go to the doctor, get a scan, get checked, and be told they're okay, structurally everything's fine, and yeah. and they go home and they might be lost. So I think right. I think a lot of people also that maybe experience chronic pain, which is a lot of people, um, maybe just think that they're just screwed and stuck with this thing forever because my my chronic hip pain has been hurting me for 12 years i've yeah, seen five doctors yeah. they were told me it's fine maybe your mother has hip pain and she told you about how she's suffering with it and maybe the doctor and again language is so powerful and this is one of the biggest things i also want to promote and that's a big part of this um, therapy as well is reshape the way that you think and talk to yourself too the do also doctors I mean imagine how doctors I mean clients come to me every day and tell me what the doctor told them they told them your back is gonna uh, uh, is, is as brittle as a 150 year old or like you need to be really careful with your back because you could it could snap at any time like giving those like well meant um, proclaimers for, for people to be careful but actually promoting fear Mm. Um, and and this is so powerful. And there's people that that that's it. You you killed this person just with a sentence right now. There's people who changed their whole life. Who who will stop bending? Who will stop picking up their grandchildren? Who will stop functioning because of one sentence the doctor said without paying attention how it hits this person? If they can take that, or if that's the truth, or or, or what what good did you do with that right now? Yeah. Like so so we need to reshape the language around pain. So what I do the first step is when I ask someone that we have identified that he has um, neuroplastic pain and we are in the treatment for this neuroplastic pain, I will not ask them, how does the pain feel like? When we do the exercise, we're doing a mindfulness meditation. They usually have their eyes closed yeah. and we just starting to feel the body this is very hard for most of the population to come from the head into the body right because yeah. especially like you know you show up to the doctor let's say with an injury or to the hospital they mm -hmm. ask you what's your pain from one to ten right it's a very difficult one to answer no 
I do the same with the rating and and look, it's going to get more difficult with this treatment. I'm not just going to ask you one to ten. I'm going to ask you, how does it feel like? Give me five adjectives that describe the quality mm. of your sensation. Okay. So that could be how big is the size? Is it the size of a coin? Is it the size of a hand? Is it moving? Is it localized? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it tingling? Is it warm? Is it pulsating? So and those are important components of right. the pain you're experiencing. And then we can see, and what we're trying to do is we are, sha we are reshaping the pathway from the lens of fear to pivot to a lens of what we call objective curiosity. So you come to the same place, which in your perception is a war zone, and now you're pivoting and you lower your hypervigilance through the breath and you're lowering and you're becoming objective and now you just observe, you become the observer. And you say, okay, I see the sensation is the size of a coin. It is kind of dull, it's warmish, and it's maybe, um, glittering a little bit over to my left pinky finger. Yeah. So we're trying to befriend the sensation to really get to know the sensation instead of running away and trying to remove it and push it away. Yeah. And that brings me to one really important point that I want to connect also mm -hmm. again to the sex yeah. therapy and what we talked about before. Treating discomfort and and befriending our body and doing therapy the most important for me that I also try to incorporate a lot is let's remove the goal. I know you're suffering. I know you pay me for, for a goal and you want to reach something, right? But if your goal is to change and to remove and to fight something, yeah. then the therapy will be very hard, very painful, and probably not effective. So... In the therapy, when we talk about pain or pelvic floor or sex, we want to remove the goal and we want to say, okay, let's just talk. Let's just sit here and see what is. And then slowly we're going to start using what there is without trying to change you, without trying to remove anything, right? If you have a hard time feeling your body and you're thinking a lot, that's fine. Stop fighting it. It's okay. We st Stop fighting yourself, right? Stop fighting your pain. Let's listen to it for a moment because it's the language of your body to communicate through your to your consciousness through sensations. So listening to yourself, to your body, because your body is always right, okay? Listening to it. And removing the goal from sex, Penetration is not sex. Orgasms are not sex. In, uh, in the podcast from uh, Matan Hakimi a few weeks ago, I heard a great sentence. Um, people are not making love uh, with each other. They're giving each other orgasms. So don't use each other for orgasms, right? Make love. Look into each other's eyes. Build up true intimacy. And, and that's something that is also without a goal. If I meet you where you are as you are, that's all. That's already my goal. And whatever happens, happens. So I don't have to have an erection. I don't have to be wet. I don't have to function, right? Because that's our goal. It's just to be here and look into each other's eyes and that's it. Whatever happens, happens. And if we want to, something to happen after, we can communicate about that. And if I say no, cool. If I say yes, wonderful. So removing the goal and the pushing and the functioning from our sexuality, from our life, from our health, from every aspect of our life that's so like um, driven by being productive, by being just, you know, like sharp all the time and, and tough and perfect, you know? Fuck it. Don't be perfect. Just be. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Just with all these therapies, with all the sound healing, with all the emotional work with all the pelvic floor stuff teaching people how to how they can be again going through all these different hoops just to come back to just one truth one truth here now 
breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> yeah. So and and that was uh, PRT, pain reprocessing, reprocessing therapy. Ther- okay. Exactly. Pain reprocessing therapy. Exactly. Um, and is it so? Is that made for people with chronic pain specifically? Yes. Yes. Um, and has that opened your eyes to new things that maybe you were not aware of, like in the past? It's a huge tool. It's a huge tool. PRT um, is is a great tool. I also recommend everyone to to look it up online. It's a it's a concept um, that exists for a while. There also every practitioner, every healthcare practitioner can take this course. Um, and I recommend if you're having experience already with therapy, if you're a therapist um, yeah. or a yoga teacher or anything like that, it can help you. Of course, it's more helpful if you have more healthcare um, background. Um, it's better. It's easier to use then. Yeah, you have more context if around it. You have it. more context um, around it, but yeah, it's, so, it's a great tool. So pain re- re- um, reprocessing therapy. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, how does uh, sound healing come into all this because that's the third right the third yeah. thing you've been on a mission to uh... right right so it's super 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 fresh i'm actually like yeah. kind of like nervous to talk about it because it's just a, a tiny tiny baby so let me so let me ask you from um you know at least it's a conceived baby i'm um, still uh not even conceived no it's not yeah. even conceived it's, oh, like, not even. <laughs> it's still in the in the tummy like I'm, yeah. i just started an online course uh from my friend her name is julia uh, you can find her account uh, is called uh, Julia Ori- Origin Frequency, uh, and she made an online course, and I just, um, yeah. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it with her, Very, and she's a great sound healer and a good friend. But is that something you practice before? I have, I've gone to her sound healings. So I you've love been to sound the, okay. I've been to sound healing before. Okay, so how does sound healing? How does it feel for you, Sonia? For me, Sonia, it feels. Uh, it brings me. Is into is the this now. Um, when we do the um? Is that a sound healing? Yeah, because component? you're doing a, a sound, and that's healing. But yeah. it does have to be an intention behind the sound, or could my sound of umming give you a uh, first of all? You benefit? for sure have an intention when you're doing an um, right? Because yeah. your intention is something that, you, that lives within you that you want to bring into this sound. So for sure the the sound of um and the frequency and just the the vibration of your voice and your throat is beneficial for you is beneficial for me um so with our voices we can for sure heal people and frequencies of our voices and the and uh, the way that we're expressing definitely is also we could for sure throw in there yeah so and so based on your experiences do you see it as something that you can incorporate into your practice and use parts of it to help people of course so so when we're connecting this again to the other points we touched on which is um regulating people's nervous system right we said it's a big point for sexual health is regulating it though is it um can i also see it as maybe like having some personal control over my I nervous system. I would never use the word control. The language, 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 about, language, language. <laughs> yes, um, yes. A connection. I have a better connection with my um, with my nervous system. Um, yeah, if the not word control. connection is, is... Because what is the regulation? Regulation is me is me regulating my nervous system, no? No. So what, who's re- so what is regulating? Oh, who's regulating? Welcome to the rabbit hole. Oh, man. Who is regulating Who our is nervous it? system? God. What is regulating our nervous system? Everything around us. The light, the smell, our senses. Everything mm. is perceived from your senses, basically. Right? Everything is perceived. And everything that's not perceived by your senses. Vibration, subconscious things that our body, like, like um, our tissues even, are sensing. Right? Mm. That is regulating our nervous system. Other people, um, things that happen kilometers away could influence me right now without me knowing, right? If there is uh, something big energetically happening, energies yeah. are influencing our nervous systems. We can dive into so many rabbit holes. But anyway, yeah. sound healing can also regulate because regulate, like if you think about like a DJ pult, right? You yeah. have buttons, you can regulate things. There you go. Yeah. Exactly, regulating things. And regulation is a more free thing than it is control, right? So, like, things are being regulated or, like, influenced. Okay, yeah. Right, so sound healing can definitely do that. It's a great tool for me to um, to help people um, even down-regulating 
um, into their uh, parasympathetic state a yeah. bit better and help them to shift in between sympathetic and parasympathetic states. Yeah. Um, it also is a great tool for my yoga classes. I'm teaching yoga once a week on my rooftop in Tel Aviv. So there, uh, I love to use it after uh, for sound healing for yeah for a sound healing session after the yoga. And you have you put a uh, maybe a bigger emphasis on it now that maybe you, you're thinking about it more, studying it more. Um, in terms of using it in your yoga classes, an emphasis on on, on the on the sound healing part of it, like adding that element. Look, to I mean, your yoga it's classes. still it's an embryo, so like I, I yeah. wouldn't like like talking about it right now is like yeah. a bit awkward for me because I yeah. usually don't talk about things which are not like sealed and and bagged yet. You but, know, but, but you but must see the potential in it. No, I talk about it because I want to promote sound healing for everyone who's listening, and because I think it's such a great tool. Um, to have as a practitioner to help people to just do nothing and just be. Yeah. And that's the second point why I really love it is because it 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 teaches people that just being and and laying there and enjoying frequencies can help you um, and is allowed and it's fine to rest. Yeah. Yeah. So how does it feel um, having four hours of uh, video of you talking about the pelvic floor? Terrible, horrible. Out, out. Uh, it's just out. Horrible. Uh, like, I mean, you <laughs> you were with me there. You were in the process. Yeah. Um, I think we did a great job. Um, but you, But also, yeah. you as well, uh, you were like cheering me up. Come on, Sonia, we can do this. And I was like, all right, all right, another, <laughs> another video. Um, it, but it, for me, I, I struggle with my imposter syndrome. As I told you back then, I, I texted you in the evening. I'm like, Danny, I have imposter syndrome. I was like, this is not good enough. I want to do more. I want to do it better. And, and it was really also there for me always to come back and say, Sonia, you're enough. You're enough. You're enough. Because, uh, it's my first online course. Jesus, that's so scary. Yeah. And I I really had to give myself permission to feel all the big feelings there. And also now it is really, I feel really vulnerable with that course being out there. Yeah. Um, because as you see, like uh, we are as, as healthcare, as good healthcare professionals as we are, we're always developing, right? So what I know today is not what I knew a year ago, right? But a year ago is great knowledge. Again, like it's about like lifting things up and saying, hey, you were great back then. Now, you know, different things, maybe more things. Yeah. But, you know, we can do another course soon if you want to. It's like yeah. <laughs> polishing it up a bit. But no, I, I, I think that the course is definitely very informative. It gives a lot of holistic insights of the connections um, of the pelvic yeah. floor. Um, yeah, so my first online course is out it's, there. It's, it's like, um, I, I like it a lot because I do think that it adds, it just like brings to life really, um, like an area inside us to at least consider, to at least think about, to at least really know. And again, you, you know, you really do talk about it from all these different angles, from all these different places, um, all these different analogies, all these mm -hmm. different exercises. It really it brings to life an area that's so easily dismissed. You know, it mm -hmm. could be like, um, like a page in the book that you flip and that's it. Now you moved on to the ribs. Mm -hmm. You, you passed on the, uh, the pelvic floor. So I think it does bring that to life, but is, does it, is it nice to, uh, like to, when you see good feedback, and I think I sent you a couple. I got one last night as well. Um, I can put it up right now if you want. Um, I'll send it to you after. But does, does it feel good? Does it reduce the uh, maybe imposter syndrome? That like a therapist, someone who's studied, someone who's been seeing clients, someone who's been practicing um, has learned something that helped them. Just like you in the last year or the last few months taking these different courses that has helped you in your practice as a pelvic floor specialist in many ways. Um, same with someone else taking your course. Like, do you see that connection? Um, I want to, and this is my personal therapy. This yeah. is my exercise that I'm still on it. It's just my imposter is really intense. And if you tell an imposter that they did a great job, they think that you're making fun of them. And they think that you're not, no, no, no. But like, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. so like, I'm definitely like, every time that I feel this resistance of like taking in the good feedback, I'm like taking a deep breath and I'm reminding myself that I'm enough and that I did a great job and that this exactly what you tell me, which is your perspective of reality through your filters. Yeah. I'm like, Sonia, remove your filters of fear 
and judgment against yourself and and take this in and actually enjoy that you created a wonderful course that people learn and that is really aligning with my with my message to the world is just learn about your body keep on learning and learn about the pelvic floor in this course <laughs> yeah fant fantastic fantastic yeah. um last thing i want to ask you about um it's a pretty um interesting one well, i think also at its embryo in terms of what we're exposed to psychedelic experiences a sharp cut <laughs> to psychedelic experience sharp cut so you said you um, you said you have a friend that's in burning man right um which is going on right now um where is it it's in nevada right is it in the desert in yeah. nevada um so where were you you were not in burning man um i don't know if i would if you want to ask me about psychedelic experiences if i mm. would talk about my festival Mm. So, uh, so have you done it in other? Have you done? Uh, have you had psychedelic experiences in different um, settings? I think the way that I would want to talk about psychedelic experiences on a podcast would for sure like promoting them in, uh, like a way that we see psychedelics as what they are, which are tools, right? Okay. So the same way that we talked right now about sex therapy, about PRT, about sound healing, I'm happy to put the psychedelics in the same line right so i would rather detach them from the festivals because festivals for me that's that's fun but it, it's not yeah. recreational like mm. it's more recreation it's not like a transformative like you know what i mean like it, it's not a medication it's not it's not intentional enough for me so i think if we talk about this in this frame then um psychedelics are a great way if they are used by a uh, uh, educated practitioner or a person that has um, studied um, about the psychedelics in whatever way, shape or form that they have experienced with them, um, that is used in a set and setting that is um, facilitating the purpose of the psychedelic use. Of why are we doing what we're doing? What is the why? Are you, do, and do you, know, do you know any therapists like that? That do that type of uh, thing? Uh, maybe. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll, I'll ask you off there. <laughs> maybe. Um, no, but, but is it something that's more prominent that you see? Um, like more people learning, studying, and doing it, administering it to so, people I mean, for there, therapy? There's lots of resources out there that we see that um, psychedelics are more researched. There is a lot of issues, as you know, we can go in like government against drug yeah. legalizing and why yeah. is that and all of the, the yeah, that's, system. That's not, that's not our battle. Exactly. That's not our battle here. So, yeah. <laughs> so that is this yeah. topic. But um, as we said, like the purpose of psychedelics is to for us to gain better insights about ourselves to raise the intimacy that we can have with our own emotions and our own mind. Intimacy is into me see. Exactly. So the psychedelics can help us with that. And there is different kinds of psychedelics that um, can be used in all kinds of intensities. Mm -hmm. So we can microdose where you use a very small um, amount, like micrograms of a substance. And you can also legal or, or only legal. Um only legal again it's I'm, legal. I'm i'm not i'm yeah. not so informed about all of the <laughs> the sources but um but yeah so psychedelics we can yeah. just like cut on it like this like psychedelics is um but it's a tool it's a tool that it's a, tool is, it's a real tool it's a real that tool we also again you can see the world through a lens of skepticism and fear or can you can see the world through a lens of potential and curiosity mm -hmm. And seeing the world through a lens of potential and curiosity does not mean that we are blindly promoting um, dangerous things. It means that we are respectfully um, learning about the potential and the options that we have in this world with the tools that are freely available to us. So when we think about how do you want to, um, which therapy do you want to choose in life? Do you want to go to the gym? Do you want to go to a singing circle? Do you want to see a therapist? Do you want to take drugs? Choose your tool, but choose it wisely and choose it not from a perspective of fear, but choose it from a perspective of potential and curiosity. 
you said you were going to sing a song for us today, no? Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much. This is uh, a part two with you. Um, so super exciting. I just checked the clock and, um, you know, I'm, I'm sad that it went by so quickly. Uh, but I can't wait for you to be the first guest to uh, do a part three. Uh, hopefully we don't have to wait 30 episodes from now and we can uh, squeeze something in um, until then. Um but thank you very much. Is there anything else that you um, it was important for you to add, to touch on, to share before we end? No, I think we said it all. Good. Well, this studio is way more comfortable than last time. Yeah. Um, I, it was great talking to you again. Again, I will be. You gave me a lot of uh, food for thought and I will be more educated on this stuff the, the next time I see you. Uh, can't wait to learn more about the sound healing. So good luck uh, with that and good luck with all the studying that you're doing. Um, and yeah, so that concludes episode number 32 of the Treatment Room Secrets podcast with Dr. Uh, not Dr., but the um, uh, Sonia the Physio on Instagram, right? Um, yeah. any we have the online course, which is the holistic view of the pelvic floor, on the website neilasher.com. Um, so Sonia Forrester, thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> If you liked this video and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification button.